Welcome back to Benny's Custom Works, proudly supported by Valvoline and Spares Box. Don't forget Benny 5 on checkout. This week we're down here at Circle D uh, Specialties with Pete Nichols. Uh, some of you guys may remember Pete from some of my earlier videos in previous USA trips. So Circle D, for those of you that aren't aware, are a premium performance torque converter company. They knock out all sorts of cool converters, including the one that's in the Cresta. So today, Pete and I are gonna take you through um, the main components of a bolt together uh, traditional style torque converter, um, including a final assembly of one of these units. So something for everyone to learn, including myself, because I really don't know what goes on inside these as much as I run a performance converter myself. Um, I'm still pretty new to this game. So Pete is an old hand at this and has tons of knowledge, so he's gonna share that with all of us. Take it away, Pete. Thanks for having me on. So we have a couple of different converters laid out here. They're actually both the same Pro Series 252 millimeter model, which is a really versatile product offering that we have. And we can make this type of converter work well with anywhere from around like 700 wheel horsepower to 2300 plus. We'll just run through the parts and kind of name them and give you an idea of what's going on here. As a fun example, we have one of our billet steel drive covers here. This is the same cover that is in Benny's Cresta. So it's got the eight volt CF PCD on it. It's got the Barra crankshaft spigot on it. So. We offer custom options like this to allow us to be able to have a, a unique engine side to the converter and then your power glide or your Turbo 400 or your 480 E or what have you as far as the gearbox goes. Um, and it can help eliminate cumbersome adapters and odd flex plates and just, you know, fitment issues, stuff that you can run into with that. It just makes the install a lot easier. And then here we have one of our Billa Alloy drive covers. This is a dedicated GM style cover. It's got um, two different PCD options in this particular example. We have the small pattern commonly associated with Power Glide and Turbo 350 and the large pattern commonly associated with Turbo 400. Um, we actually offer this cover with three different styles of PCD depending on the flex plate you're running. Uh, we do a bronze spigot here. Um, that reduces potential micro welding between the pilot and where it engages inside your crankshaft, which can happen on a steel spigot. Moving on, we have the pump weld ring that accompanies the bolt together front. We have heat treated steel dowel pins that gets press fit into the pump ring to positively locate the ring to the drive cover. And they're also asymmetrical location, so that way once it's clocked, it's clocked. You can't potentially clock it incorrectly um, when you're servicing the converter. Something that's unique to our product line, normally in the drive cover, you'll typically have a turbine support bushing in this area that centers the turbine pilot. Instead of a bushing, we do a deep groove ball bearing that presses into this area here. And the idea behind the deep group ball bearing is that it eliminates a source of friction between the turbine pilot and the bushing that would normally be in here. Um, and it also eliminates potential wear material that's gonna be generated normally from a bushing. So it's more of a uh, heirloom item, so to speak. It doesn't really wear, have any issues. And uh, it has deep groove races in here. So it actually does handle uh, axial thrust loads quite well. Uh, moving on from there, we have the turbine of the converter. As you can see, you have your splined drive here that engages your input shaft of the transmission. We have our bearing surface. Um, we do these billet steel anti-ballooning plates in-house in our own billet steel turbine hub. Uh, you'll see that we have heavy duty TIG welding on all the blades. That reinforces the blades and helps prevent them from flexing and tearing over time. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of force going on with the fluid dynamics in the converter in a running condition, and these blades can potentially flex and tear in certain cores. We have the pump here. You can see similar treatment with the heavy-duty TIG welding. We have our billet steel bearing flange, and again, billet steel anti-ballooning plate and this is our own billet steel hub as well that's your pump drive hub so that's what's engaging your pump gear in the transmission pump itself so this is actually even though this is what's going into the transmission this is the engine driven element of the converter 
or passing fluid between the pump and the turbine to make the turbine spin, which in turn makes your input shaft spin and sends power through your gearbox. And then we move on to the stator. The stator is really what kind of makes the magic happen. Um, in our 252 millimeter series, everything we do is billet steel. Uh, we design these in-house using computational fluid dynamic software. So we're actually plotting the fluid flow fields in the converter in a live running condition in our software simulation before we ever cut metal. So we have an idea of what the converter is going to do, how it's going to act, the torque multiplication that it's going to provide, the stall speed characteristics it's going to provide before we ever even make a part. And then we'll program this in SOLIDWORKS and then we have our own 5-axis CNC machinery equipment that we machine these on in-house. So it's pretty trick stuff. Um, of course, the stator is still pretty conventional construction as far as staters go, but these are unique airfoil blade designs that um, are unique to Circle D specialties um, rather than having conventional uh, fabricated steel staters with flat blades. Um, we like to rely heavily on the airfoil stuff. It gives us a much bigger tuning window with stator technology. Um, we can generate different K-factor profiles with the stator and make the converter do all kinds of different things that you just can't achieve with a flat blade stator. And inside the stator board here, you're going to have either a solid billet steel spragless hub. You can see the spline in there that's going to engage the stator tube on the transmission pump. That will permanently affix the stator in position to the transmission pump in a running condition. Or we also have a mechanical diode option, shares the same stator spline. This is a one-way clutch for the stator. You can see it locks if I try and turn it one direction, but then it freewheels in the other. Um, generally speaking, with our 252 stuff, we get the most favorable data in terms of drag racing, the best coupling characteristics, lower ET, more mile per hour across the board going spragless. So what you're saying is I should really put a spragless in the Cresta pick? I, ideally, I mean a spragless insert could be worth, you know, potentially a tenth. What, for people like me at home that don't really understand what the differences or the potential benefits of say running a mechanical diode, um, can you just kind of break that down so that we can all have a bit more of an understanding of why you would choose one or the other? Yeah, so as the converter's in a running condition, you're your engine is spinning your pump and we're passing fluid from the outer blades of the pump to the outer blades of the turbine. We're forcing the turbine to spin and then that fluid is redirected through the veins up through the stator, redirected and accelerated back to the pump to drive, provide drive energy and torque multiplication. Um, as RPM increases and your turbine speed starts to couple to your pump speed, uh, the fluid flow dynamic shifts inside the converter. Centrifugal force is forcing your fluid towards the outer shell of the converter. You have less fluid motion being generated through here and through the stator. And the fluid will actually begin, instead of pushing on the inside of the blade, creating torque multiplication, it'll shift and start pushing on the outside of the blade. And with the diode, it, it would allow the stator to overrun with your pump speed and your turbine speed so that we're eliminating fluid shearing between all these rotating components. So in a coupled condition, whether you're, you know, cruising at say 50 kilometers an hour, you know, through town or you're going down the interstate at 80 kilometers an hour, your converter's in a coupled condition to the point where that fluid dynamic has changed. It's flowing over the backside of the stator vein and allowing the stator to overrun, eliminating that fluid shearing helps the converter run cooler. Because anytime you're shearing fluid inside the converter, you're generating frictional losses and heat. So that's what you'll run into with a spragless converter. Um, that being said, with modern stator designs and our ability to manipulate fluid flow characteristics, as long as you have adequate transmission cooling in the vehicle, we have many, many examples out there of spragless converters in street cars, drag and drive cars, um, even heavier truck applications that are still able to maintain adequate transmission fluid operating temperature in spragless conditions. So at that point, at least specifically to our 252 millimeter product, 
the diode versus spragless debate really just comes down to personal preference. So, you, so what you're saying is basically that I'm a sook. I mean, you know, call it what you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, the Cresta should pick up 18 mile per hour spragless. Based so what you're saying the... is you guarantee it'll run a seven as soon as I put a spragless in it? Guaranteed. To the lift. <laughs> So now that I've just interrupted you, let's let's flow on through yeah, and uh, continue the process. So you're, whether you go spragless or diode, they're both gonna insert inside of the stator. You have locating lugs that you can see. Once that's seated down inside the stator, you have a stator cap that'll sit on top of there. That stator cap will retain the spragless piece or the diode and a snap ring sits inside that groove to keep the stator cap and everything assembled into the stator body. And then of course we have our stator bearing. So you have a turbine bearing that's gonna run between the stator and the bearing surface of the turbine. And then once you have all your guts assembled, you have your pump bearing. This is a three piece pump bearing that we like to use to promote oil flow through the pump bearing and help the pump bearing run cooler because this is your highest stress bearing in a converter. And that's something you guys have changed semi recently you were saying? Yeah, this is new for us this year and we've, we've played with a couple of different designs. This is our most recent iteration and so far it seems to be working out well for us. And you know, that's pretty straightforward. It just assembles race, bearing, race. That's going to ride in there and provide your bearing between the stator and the pump bearing surface here. And that's really your all your components going on inside a uh, your typical classic power glide or turbo 400 drag, drag racing style converter. Um, and then we have a an example over here that it's all washed, clean ready to assemble and we can run you through an assembly of a bolt together converter um, for your edification. The ready final to... assembly. This is pretty cool. So this is this is genuinely a customer converter that you are going to pack. Correct. Or that will go through the packing department and will ship to a customer. Exactly. By the time this video is on the internet, this will be in someone's car because this video is probably not going to come out for three or four weeks. Yeah, hopefully. Um, but in, so... in saying that, in the time I've been here, I've literally seen 200 converters already go through the shop. Um, now that's that's a pretty mean feat in itself and Pete was saying that's com probably within the top five volume in the country but some of the larger shops are also doing potentially um, less involved builds shall we say so these are all um, completely hand assembled and, and every single one of them every single tolerance is checked so it's, uh, it's a pretty impressive facility and yeah Pete just keeps cranking these suckers out yeah, we have a really great team. Um, I handle all the bolt togethers and a lot of the hardcore drag racing stuff. And then we have other builders that handle more of the production oriented stuff. But everything is more, we, we focus our product line on more of a higher end um, billet style of build with premium components. So even though this is like our upper echelon drag racing converter, these features that you see highlighted here are largely incorporated throughout our product line. So even our regular builders are still building a very high level, um, high quality component, even if it's just going in a basic street car or um, a hot rod truck or anything along those lines. But uh, moving on into assembly, you can see we have our bearing pressed into the drive cover. And we have our bench conveniently drilled so that we can keep the drive cover located during assembly. So we'll just thread some locating studs into the threaded converter pads. And There's that, no need to actually bolt that to the bench, right? You're basically no, just holding it just floats it in, there. in there so that way when we do final assembly and torquing of the fasteners, it doesn't, the converter's not moving around on the table. Yeah, nice. I did I, I did see that pattern drilled in there earlier and I was like, I wonder why they'd get through the bottom and put the bolts on it and then these <laughs> sneaky little studs come out. Right. Almost like you've done this before, Pete. Right. We like to use some white lithium grease in the O-ring groove. Just This helps retain the O-ring to the groove so during assembly it's not trying to wiggle its way out, so to speak, if you happen to jar the converter during assembly or anything like that. And a little bit of lubricant on the O-ring material itself helps it compress nicely and prevent any surface abrasion on the o-ring that could maybe potentially lead to a leak down the road i i will admit that the one time i had my bolt together apart previously 
that was the hardest thing in the world to retain that o-ring yeah and so in the old bolt together that was a that was a massive fight to actually keep right. that o-ring in situ and uh, i think i ended up using like half a kilo of rubber grease to try yeah. and hold the thing together yeah rubber grease works because it was a fight um white lithium is great uh, automatic transmission shops use a product called Transgel that works really well. Um, in a pinch, you can even use petroleum jelly, and it works just ah, fine. Ah, the old vaso. Yep. So, we have our turbine that we're going to go ahead and drop into the deep groove ball bearing. We have our turbine bearing. We have our stator already assembled. This is a spragless unit, so you can see I cannot turn the spline in either direction. So this custom is not a sook? Not a sook. Nice. <laughs> the stator just sits inside the turbine and floats on the bearing like so. We have our three-piece pump bearing. And then we have the pump. You can see this has the dowel pins pressed into the pump ring that are going correspond with these asymmetrical locations so the pump can only clock one way that and way that's important so when you put that on the balancer if someone is to say do a state of change either at home or in another shop it's always going to go back together the same way and it's always guaranteed to be balanced right exactly not only balanced but also this converter is finished well the pump and the ring are finished welded as an assembly to a precise run out and if you were to re-clock the pump if these dowel pin locations weren't asymmetrical, you could potentially create a runout condition because the pump is differently located relative to the front cover. So yeah, it's a, a critical piece. So line that up. And then what I like to do is and this applies to if you're servicing your own converter as well, whether you had a transmission failure and you want to clean it out or um, put new bearings in it for whatever reason, or you're doing a stall change and you want to change your stator, um, the same assembly process holds true. Um, I like to put four bolts in, clocked roughly 90 degrees apart, just as a starter. You never assemble a converter with this as far as final assembly goes. We always want to torque these fasteners to spec, but you can use an electric wrench or an air wrench to lightly seat the fasteners. Yeah. You don't want to go hammering them home and pulling threads in your drive cover. It's basically just a time save just to run them down, right? Exactly. Especially being that you've assembled so many of these, you've also got the feel for what's right and what's wrong. Right. And we just sneak that down because the dowel pins do have a light press fit into the front cover. So we want to evenly draw everything down. And you can always watch your air gap between the halves to see when you're fully seated. Good. and then I like to do a preliminary check you have end float in the converter so you don't want things smashed together and preloading your turbine bearing or your pump bearing if you do you're gonna quickly destroy the pump bearing with any preload that's present in the converter so we'll typically build these um, it's a forgiving tolerance but we aim for like 10 to 20 thousandths of end float inside the converter it's a hot between a quarter and a half of a millimeter yeah sorry for the metric homies yeah. at home yank imperial measurements yeah. sorry so i like to use a pair of snap ring pliers i'll just reach down inside the pump hub i'll grab the stator spline i'll make sure the tur the stator turns and you can feel the end play in there and that still has its end play in it so we know that we're safe to go ahead and proceed with putting the rest of the bolts in and torquing the spec if I ran into a scenario where my end play is gone and I preload in the bearings, then this converter would come back apart and I would do some machining to one or the other of the bearing surfaces in order to get that end play back. We don't typically have that problem on a new assembly, um, but sometimes during the welding process, it's rare when it happens, but you can lose end play during the welding process. and so. You may have to go back in and do a little bit of machining. Would you, for argument's sake, take half of 
the measurement from each one or it kind of just each one is a little bit different or? i like to go half of each yeah. so that we're not changing stator to turbine or stator to pump clearance too excessively yeah cool yeah my my non-engineering non-torque converter brain <laughs> tells me that you kind of take half off each one right yeah try to keep things equal. keep it centered exactly. rather than just take 10 thou off of one side and send it exactly and then all of right. a sudden your clearance isn't what you calculated for would that potentially change stall characteristics or yeah so as we move the stator blades closer to the pump blades here we can actually increase the stall speed characteristics of the converter um, and the inverse holds true further away can tighten it um, as we increase clearance between the backside of the stator blades and the turbine blades um, we can increase stall and the inverse holds true with that as well we drop this clearance the converter can act tighter when we're dealing in micro fractions of an inch or a millimeter um, those differences are negligible enough that it's not going to give you any measurable change in stall characteristics we're talking large movements of clearance like um, i would say typically starting around one millimeter 40 thousandths American, 50 thousandths, um, is where you're going to start seeing actual stall characteristic differences. Um, that's a fair bit of material in, in engineering and machining It's a huge amount. Terms. It's like, a that's mile. a lot of material, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's actually a lot more than I would have anticipated, to be honest. I right. was expecting like 0.25 of a mil would, would kind of start to be an issue or a change. Yeah. It, it takes a pretty big movement of clearances to, to alter it. Um, but the reason I focus on the end place so much and what I'm talking about is for any of you watching this as an end user who has a bolt together and is doing a stator change, you want to check that end play and make sure it's still present with your new stator because if for some odd reason your stator didn't have the exact same dimension here, even fractions of a millimeter different could be enough to take away your end play and then you have preload in the bearing at which point some machining is going to be necessary um, to regain that end play and you don't end up smashing the pump bearing out of the converter once you start running it's also worth mentioning too i guess pete that if you've got a bolt together converter um i mean although it probably goes without saying don't mix and match manufacturers of stators with rebuilds or assemblies of converters yeah generally that's pretty difficult to do because i mean obviously in the converter world you have a lot of great options um, with all the different brands out there um, a lot of highly performing converters from various builders but it kind of holds true throughout the industry that whether you're looking at one of ours or one of our competitors um, the parts are a little bit different enough that usually they aren't going to freely interchange so it does make mixing and matching more difficult. However, if you do find yourself in a scenario, oh, I bought this used bolt together, and then this bloke had this batch of extra stators, and you try to start mixing and matching parts between brands, like Benny says, you get yourself in trouble quickly. You're gonna have a bad time. Yeah. Now, is it possible to do machine work and make brand X stator fit in brand Y converter? Sure. But, That's not really um, what I meant, though. It's yeah. more just like if you're at home and you see a cheap stator online or whatever like exactly. you decide to go hey up I, I, i'd assume this is probably more information for the used converter market like if right. you picked up a a converter off yellow bullet or something online exactly. picked it up cheap and then it's not quite what you're after and potentially can't even identify the manufacturer yeah you go and grab a a, a stator online and go oh yeah this might work and yeah. Mixing try and throw is, it together yeah yeah you're in for a bad time it's a guaranteed bad day almost 90 100 percent of the time it's a good chance of a bad day the final assembly is pretty straightforward we just get the fasteners hand started and you want to do this and and uh, not use your drive tool to start the fastener because it's really easy to cross thread a fastener and especially then, with these aluminium colors exactly right? sorry aluminum <laughs> alloy sure we'll go with that uh yeah and if you cross thread it then you're stuck doing a thread repair you're and, married you to know. it yeah and 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 i guess on a uh on a manufacturing level you really don't want to be sending out a brand new converter with it's already got a thread repair in it yeah that's not a good look so we'll just go ahead and lightly seat these
then on this particular cover, we like to do a final torque of 23 foot pounds. I don't know what that is in Newton meters. Just flip it over. Um, you gotta be smarter than the torque wrench. Uh, that would be like 28.3 Newton meters. Um, you always want to follow your converter manufacturer's recommendations. So that's our torque spec for this specific converter. And would you have a different spec if it was a steel bottom cover? Uh, we'll typically go 25 foot pounds on the steel with the same 5 16 24 imperial fastener. Um, we do have an other cover option that we use for our big shaft converters. Um, those torque to 30 foot pounds but it can vary from manufacturer to manufacturer based on material type and thread size. So always follow your manufacturer's recommendations specific to your brand of converter on that. We'll just go around and tighten these to spec. And I like to do that just to mark where I started as an easy reference. Now I noticed you're not using the uh, BCW painted to torque elbow. This is actually a real torque wrench. So. Yes, actually. Uh, yeah. I like that. That's nice. <laughs> I hope I would have blown out by now. And this is fundamental information that a lot of your viewers probably already know, but when you're tightening a fastener to spec, you never want to jerk the torque wrench. You want a nice smooth pulling action. And ideally when you get the torque, you want the wrench 90 degrees, uh, basically parallel with your body, but 90 degrees from where you started. Um, torque wrenches are calibrated specific um, with that type of uh, tightening process in mind, you always want to pull the wrench toward you and not push it. That gives you the most accurate preload from the fastener, most accurate torque setting. And then I like to just run through the next three for no particular reason, and it just makes me feel better to make sure that uh, everything pulled down evenly and we don't have any loose fasteners from where we started. Is um, there any reason that you don't? kind of do a crisscross pattern or it's just not necessary? Um, because these are precision machined flanges, um, parallel flat surfaces, um, once they're seated, they're seated very precisely together in terms of um, maintaining flatness. So, I mean, sure, you could do a star pattern if you wanted to work your way out through 30 fasteners on how to do that. Um, I don't personally have the mental capacity to do that, and I've never had a problem doing it this way. <laughs> that is the most politically correct answer you'll get to. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and that is a assembled Pro Series 252 millimeter Circle D Specialties billet bolt together converter. So we can go ahead and take our alignment studs out. And every converter has a job card that travels with it throughout the shop, so. I do like that process, actually. I've seen a lot of these green cards and there's also <laughs> different colors and. We'll take this over to our quality control area. And from here, the converter runs through our QC process. It actually gets dumped in a tank of water and pressurized with shop air so we can check it for leaks. It passes leak. We flip the converter upside down and we run this up through the pump hub to check actual end float in the converter so we get a final true end plane measurement and we document that. We'll run it through the height gauge for a final overall height spec. That's from your pump hub, your converter pads. Um, from there, uh, we serialize everything. Some converters already have a serial number engraved in them during the CNC machining process of the front cover. Um, others, like the bolt togethers, um, they get serialized after, so we'll actually metal stamp the serial in there. Once it's stamped, the converters go through balancing. Our balancing process is a little unique in the industry. We actually install a basically what simulates your input shaft, but it's a stub shaft, and then this seals inside the pump hub, and we charge the converter full of ATF um, before we balance it, and then we run it on the spin balancer, and by charging it full of oil, we simulate as close to a dynamic running condition as possible so we get the best balance possible. And we balance everything to zero grams, so <clears throat> we'll add weight. Um, little sheet metal weights that we'll weld to the body of the converter to bring it in balance when needed. After balancing, they go to the paint booth for final paint. 
and then over here they're staged for shipping. Well that's a wrap for this week's episode. I really hope you guys enjoyed a uh, pretty technical episode involving torque converters, especially the Circle D stuff. Massive thank you to Chris, Pete and all the crew down here at Circle D, not only for today's episode but for also supporting our uh, drag week, sick week campaign for 2022-2023. Uh, these guys have actually been storing the cars for us as well as all our spares and they've also been receiving all the parcels we've been sending here so massive thanks to those guys. Um, yeah, really appreciate the support and can't thank them enough. Thanks for watching guys, we'll see you next time.